welcome to MBL SciShoots. I'm Karen Echeverry. I'm an associate scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. And today I'm going to tell you about my work on regeneration using axolotls. So the ability to regenerate is actually really widespread throughout the animal kingdom and also in plants. Plants are in fact one of our best examples of regeneration. So people have often cut off a branch of a plant and then you put it in water and you'll see the new roots growing and from that a whole new plant will grow. Animals regenerate in many different ways. For example, a simple flat worm like planaria can be cut into multiple pieces and each piece of the worm will regenerate. In stark contrast to that, a deer or a moose can actually sheds its antlers every year and this is a process of regeneration and so it will regrow those antlers each year but each year it adds a new point to the antlers. But other parts of the deer can't regenerate while an animal like a salamander here if you cut off its limbs it can regenerate. So why do we study these? Well Humans are in fact really bad at regenerating. So a newborn baby has the highest potential to regenerate, so it can even regenerate parts of its heart tissue. Young children up to the age of four or five are reported to actually be able to regenerate the digit tip. As we age, this ability to regenerate declines and is highly dependent on our age and our health. We may have all read the Greek myth about Prometheus. So Zeus was very mad at Prometheus, so he sent him um, to an island and it was tied to a rock and Zeus sent an eagle to eat Prometheus's liver. But every night Prometheus actually regenerated its liver completely. But this is really a myth. Humans can regenerate our liver, but we can only regenerate a small portion of it and we certainly can't do it overnight. It takes a long time. And this is highly dependent on our age and our health. But other animals are really good at regeneration, like the axolotl. So axolotls are really good at regenerating their limbs. So here we see an example of axolotl limb regeneration. So this dashed green line it indicates where the amputation plane was, so where we cut off tissue. And so the first thing that has to happen in regeneration is that you have to heal that wound. And so the skin um, crawls over from all sides, and these axolotls don't form any scar tissue. And then at that injury signal recruits cells to the injury site. And then you have this mound of proliferating undifferentiated cells. And then over time, what you'll see here is, is that eventually these cells somehow get a signal and they actually replace the lost tissue. And you'll see that you have a limb which looks identical to the limb that was there before. And so it has the same function. And so we're often asked, well, does an axolotl limb look anything like a human limb? So if we look inside the limb here, and here we're using a histological stain called alcine blue, what we'll see is the axolotl limb has a radius and ulna just like we have. If we look at the structure of the hand, we can see that it actually has the metacarpal structure and it has the same uh, phalanges, so the same bones in the fingers as humans have. One thing you might notice is, is the, that the axolotl actually only has four digits and we have five digits. So interestingly, the axolotl's front limbs have four digits, but the hind limbs actually have five digits. But what this allows us to do is, is that it tells us the axolotl actually has the same bone structure as we have, it has the same functioning in the hands as we have, so it allows us to, to study both regeneration of bone, of nerves, of blood vessels. So where do these amazing animals actually come from? So their natural habitat is a lake above Mexico City. Sadly, due to a lot of pollution, they're almost extinct in Mexico. However, there is a big conservation project and they have been found still in the wild there. But what you'll see from this image is, is that the lake no longer really looks like a lake. It's really a series of canals. So the animals that we work on are bred in captivity in our own research facilities at the MBL. So we have very specialized equipment. So we have these large uh, tanks here that you see. So we, ha we can control the temperature in the room, we can control the, the composition of the water. We can keep animals in individual tanks so they're not uh, actually um, biting at each other, which does happen in nature. And we can cool the room. And so these are very specialized structures where we actually are recirculating the water, these canisters are special mechanical and carbon filters to filter out in impurities in the water. 
we keep animals individually so that we can actually track our breeding lines. Um, we can keep males versus females separately. We can grow up animals of different um, ages. And this is um, a lot of work uh, to keep the animals healthy and well fed. And it takes about a year to, to for them to reach sexual maturity. And so as you can see here, you can take these um, individual tanks off of the system very easily. So one thing you might have noticed during our quick tour of our axolotl facility is that you might have seen that we actually have animals of different skin color. So just like humans have different amounts of pigment in their skin, so do axolotls. And so the ones with very little pigment, we call them whites. And this is what we mainly use in our lab for experimental purposes. But axolotls also occur with very um, yellow pigment in the skin, and this is referred to as a golden axolotl. You also have ones which um, have a lot of green, almost black pigment. These are the ones you find most commonly in the wild. And this may be because this dark pigment allows them to camouflage from their predators more easily. So how long does it take to become an adult axolotl? So in fact, they have a relatively long, what we call generation time. So what you see here is proud parents with their new embryos. So a female axolotl will actually lay a, between 200 to 300 embryos. So the embryos are these small black dots you see in the tank here, and they're surrounded by this protective jelly coat. And so they develop in this jelly coat until they're about um, a month old, and then they basically eat their way out of the jelly coat. And here next what you see is young larval animals, which are about a month old. So what makes axolotls such a great animal for studying regeneration? Well, one of the reasons we uh, choose to use axolotl as a research organism is because the white animals are optically transparent. So what does that mean? What it really means is, is that we can easily see through the animal. So here's a beautiful example in a larval animal. Where we're actually looking in to, through the head of the animal, and what you can see is you can actually see the brain of the axolotl. So these two front lobes, this is the front lobes, this is the forebrain of the axolotl. Then you see a thinner structure, that's the midbrain, and then the hindbrain, and then we can see this it connected to the spinal cord. Another beautiful example of the optical clarity of the animal is the next video here where we're actually looking in the gills. So these are the gills of the axolotl here. So this is how it breeds underwater. And so what we see here is, is that we can focus in with the microscope onto the gills and we can actually see the single blood cells flowing through the gills. And so we can use this optical um, transparency to our advantage to ask questions about where do cells come from um, after injury. And so this, here we see an amputated tail and we can see very clearly the structures of the muscle, the structure of the spinal cord and the skin cells. And these red cells here are the blood cells which immediately migrate to the injury site just like they do when we injure ourselves. We first uh, seal off the injury site by forming a blood clot. Another beautiful example of the optical transparency of the axolotl is shown here. So you're looking at two different axolotls, but in one you can actually see the chambers of the heart beating. Another tool that we use um, to study regeneration is the ability to actually label certain cell types. And again, in this video, what we're seeing is, is that scientists have inserted a green fluorescent protein and we're actually looking at the muscle in the heart beating using this fluorescent protein. So one area of research that we're particularly interested in in my lab is using axolotls to understand scar-free regeneration. So an axolotl will heal a, any type of wound without forming scar tissue. When it regenerates its limb or its heart or parts of its brain or parts of its spinal cord, it all does so without forming scar tissue. This is in contrast to humans. So humans were very good if we have a little boo-boo on our knee or our arm, we can um, regenerate that skin without forming um, scar tissue. But if we have a bigger, um, full, what we call full thickness wound, which really goes down to the level of the muscle, then we can't regenerate that without forming scar tissue. In fact, it seems like we've selected for forming scar tissue rather than regeneration. 
So we very quickly heal over that wound and that helps to prevent infection and we deposit a lot of collagen. So if you have a scar on your body, you probably notice that it's um, more rounded tissue, it's denser because of a lot of collagen present in it, and it has far less sensitivity. So the neurons in your skin haven't regenerated back into it. Axolotls in comparison, if you make a skin wound right down to the level of the muscle, which you can see is in this image here, is over time it regenerates it without forming scar tissue. And it's actually really difficult in an axolotl to see where the original injury site was. So how do we study this process of scar-free regeneration? So one thing we can do is we can actually label different cell types. And here what we see is we can label blood vessels and then we can look at them during regeneration and ask what role do they play and do blood vessels also regenerate naturally and in fact they do the second thing that we can do is again use this technique of inserting green fluorescent protein into cells and in this, this little video what you see is is that we've labeled some of the skin cells with this fluorescent protein and we can image um, their response to, Im to injury live in the axolotl and this gives us information about which cells respond first to the injury signal, how long does it take them to migrate to the injury signal, do they remain as that cell type or during the regeneration process can they form other cell types. We can then compare this to what happens in a human um, model of, of skin injury. So another area of research in my lab is on spinal cord regeneration. So humans do not regenerate their spinal cord. All we see here is comparison of what happens in humans versus a salamander after injury to the spinal cord. So in humans, after a complete transection of the spinal cord, as is illustrated here, many different cell types present in the in close to the injury site migrate and form what we call a glial scar. So a glial scar is composed of glial cells, astrocytes, um, meningeal fibroblasts and these are cells which all respond to the injury cue in the, the human spinal cord and they form scar tissue and there's a good and bad side to the scar tissue in the spinal cord the good side is it helps prevent more injury occurring in the spinal cord and the bad side is those cells which make up this glial scar actually express a lot of proteins which are inhibitory to axon growth through the injury site and so then a process of valerian degeneration occurs and this happens on the, on the uh, caudal side of the injury and this results in loss of both motor and sensory activity below the site of the injury, meaning we lose our ability to walk and to sense our environment. In contrast, it was first reported by Butler and Ward back in the 1960s that if you make a lesion in the spinal cord of, of a salamander it appears that both sides of the injury start migrating towards each other it reconnects the central canal of the spinal cord and then over time that those axons can regrow through the injury site and so this is a process we continue to study today in my lab using more modern techniques in the next image what you see is an example of those axons regrowing and so the yellow box marks the injury site. And so interestingly, on the caudal side of the injury, you still see the axon sitting there in the, in the axolotl. But if you touch the tail of the axolotl, it doesn't respond. And then in the course of about 20 days, the axons regrow through the injury site and the axolotl regains both its motor and sensory control and it swims normally and can use its hind limbs again. So again, one of the techniques that we use in the lab to begin to, to study this process is this technique of using in vivo imaging um, with green, green fluorescent protein. And so what you see here is an example of a motor neuron which is labeled with the green fluorescent protein. And so with the, the imaging technology being developed all the time at the MBL, we can now image uh, deeper and for longer in live animals and this gives us a lot of information about how again these cells in your central nervous system actually respond to injury 
and will help us eventually to answer questions about do they reconnect to the same targets again or is there what we refer to as plasticity in the system? So can um, neurons connect to, for example, a muscle that it wasn't innovating before? And so how does it um, regenerate the new neural connections and how does this connect to the brain to give it the right information so that it moves its limb in the right direction? So what do we ultimately hope to learn by studying axolotls and other research organisms with the amazing ability to regenerate? So what we think is, by studying a large range of research organisms, we can gradually come up with blueprints of pathways which need to be activated or inactivated in response to injury to promote a pro-regenerative response, and that one day we'll be able to translate this to humans. I don't think we'll ever be like Prometheus, where we can constantly regenerate our liver overnight. We don't, of course, all like to be like Hugh Jackman's character Wolverine in the X-Men movies. So he has the regeneration factor, the healing factor, where he can regenerate body parts and heal really quickly. So I don't think we're ever going to be able to go to our doctors and um, ask them to prescribe the healing factor pills. But I think one day, if we understand enough about how axolotls respond to injury, then we will be able to um, begin to translate that to humans. So we may never have the axolotls superpowers of regeneration, but we do have a superpower right now. In these times of COVID-19, our superpower is to social distance, stay at home and help flatten the curve. And while we're doing that, if you have questions about regeneration or about axolotls, please leave them in the form in the comments section below.